say a few words on the schedule of uh, heavy ion collisions? Yes, so the, uh, um, uh, the ambition is to, uh, to collect uh, uh, of the order of, I would say, one, if not two femtobands of proton data as soon as possible if the detectors during the shutdown uh, from the first data really prove that they are ready for taking good data, then we should go for that as, as quickly as possible of course to blow the competition out of the water and then after that uh, we should immediately uh, uh, have uh, an ion, ion run. In an optimistic scenario that would be the end of last, before the winter stop next year, so before the end of 2009. That's optimistic. Okay. Technically the switch over I have been told is, uh, is relatively straightforward for, okay, for so the machine. Okay, so thank you very much. Let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. And the third talk of the session in the is on research for physics by Oliver Buchmüller. We can see there, but it's not up there. Okay, so now after the machine and the experiments, we come now to the search for new physics at the LHC. I would like at the beginning of my talk to give you an impression of how challenging it actually will be to carry out the search for new physics in this relative complicated environment of a proton-proton machine. And then I would like to give you some impression of how we will carry out physics analysis commissioning. So what it is it actually that it takes in order to be ready to, to, to engage into the search for new physics and here the rediscovery of the standard model at the new energy frontier will be an important part and clearly the last talk of uh, the last part of my talk then will be devoted to the search for new physics at the early days and here I will put uh, almost an exclusive focus on the direct uh, uh, discovery of new particle production uh, uh, and this will actually then take place in ATLAS and uh, CMS. A little reminder on the physics program of the LHC, which is a very comprehensive one. It is clear that the, the core of the physics program uh, are the two general purpose experiments, ATLAS and CMS, which are devoted to the search for new physics outside the standard model, but also for the search for the Higgs boson. And the program then gets completed with a dedicated uh, heavy ion experiment, at least, that together then with ATLAS and CMS will study uh, in great detail, hopefully, uh, properties of heavy ion collision. And last but not least, 
based, as it has been also uh, uh, advertised in the previous talk. We will have a dedicated bee physics experiment, which is supposed to continue the little success story Babar and Bell are currently writing in trying to over-constrain the unitarity triangle in the quark sector, and therefore potentially finding CP uh, violating effect, effects outside of the standard model. It is, as I said already, a very comprehensive and uh, important physics program which has been put in place here, but I think the most important part of this physics program is that it is really physics at a completely new energy frontier. So with the LHC, we will go into a completely new energy domain and therefore we'll have the possibility to engage, for example, in the search for the Higgs boson. As I will show you at the end of my talk, it will be essentially that we will get an answer to whether or not this particle exists. Right from the beginning on, we will also engage into the search for new particles particle production, direct new particle production, as it is, for example, being uh, predicted by supersymmetry, extra dimension, or even more exotic incarnations of new physical uh, mod uh, models like black hole production. Then we will continue also uh, a little tradition here at this laboratory of high precision electroweak measurements. We would like to uh, improve on the knowledge on the W mass uh, uh, of the, 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 the properties of the W boson, but also would like to continue what the Teverton has started in order to study in detail the properties of the top quark. And then we have the two dedicated uh, aspects of the physics program over constraining the CKM uh, unitarity triangle in order, in order to search for CP violating effects outside of the standard model and hopefully be capable of convincingly establish quark gluon plasma with Alice and the two other general purpose experiments. Now, the LHC environment. Once the decision has been made that you want to do physics at the high energy frontier, the completely new energy frontier, and you have decided to go for a Hadron Collider to be the tool in order to carry this out, you also know that at the same time you have made a choice for a very difficult environment which will make us our life extremely difficult to carry out physics. And this is essentially being uh, illustrated here in this uh, huge hierarchy uh, uh, of uh, processes which are, be which are being illustrated here. It shows that the very different uh, uh, production rates which uh, occur on a Hadron Collider and uh, this here is now the proton-proton production cross-section which for your convenience is being translated into uh, the number of events per second being produced at the instantaneous luminosity of the LHC. So this is a logarithmic scale and you clearly can see that there's a huge background of standard model processes as they're being identified here which sit on top of the processes which we're actually being interested in like Higgs production or new particle uh, physics production our experiments. So the name of the game here will really be to uh, start a search uh, uh, for new physics progresses which is similar to searching for uh, a needle in an extremely very big haystack. And in order to find this needle, we really need to understand these processes very accurately because they define our backgrounds. So that is one of the, the important issues where we will engage and it's called the rediscovery of the standard model. We have to know how these processes are going to manifest itself at this completely new energy frontier even so that conceptually they are being known. This is bringing us then to the physics commissioning with the first collision data. It is clear that the year 2008 is devoted to machine commissioning and general commissioning of our experiment, uh, alignment, calibration, etc., and etc. But since these two general purpose experiments are search experiments, we also are being aware of the fact that uh, we want to get an answer uh, uh, as fast as possible, and therefore we also put in place a physics, a very comprehensive program of work for physics commissioning and uh, with the very first collision data. And this essentially this program of work can be uh, uh, divided into uh, three phases and the first phase and now we're coming back to this little plot here is essentially being uh, determined by uh, event production rates of 10 to the 6 events per second at the startup luminosities of 10 to the 30 10 to the 31 and this essentially is trying to understand the general environment in which we are this is the production of minimum bias events and low energetic uh, uh, digest events which do dominate by far the uh, uh, the, 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 the event production which we see every 25 nanoseconds. So this stuff repeats itself essentially every 25 nanoseconds in our detector and we need to understand it. And it is clear that we have today a reasonable well understanding of what uh, the, the production cross sections for W, Z and TT bar, i.e. the high energetic or high PT uh, standard model processes are, but we have uh, a very limited understanding how this low energetic particle distribution essentially will manifest 
manifests itself in our detector. For example, the charge particle density distribution in minimum bias events, we can only predict at the level of 50% or even worse. And if there's one lesson to be learned from the Tevatron, then that we cannot rely at our Monte Carlos at the early stage, because it's very likely that this charge particle, uh, 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 particle density distribution will not be described uh, uh, by the Monte Carlos. And this is what you can see here with a plot from the CDF collaboration at the Tevatron. They have measured the charge particle density distribution as a function of the error and momentum. And all of the different Monte Carlo tunes you can see here, which they have put in place in order to predict this environment, literally fail to describe them the real measurement. And this is clearly a lesson which we have to learn. We have to go out there and we have to measure the environment in which we are. And for that reason, it is very likely that uh, the first papers which come out from the LHC or in general from these two big collaborations would clearly not be papers on a Higgs discovery or on the discovery of uh, uh, new physics outside of the standard model. It will more likely be bread and butter stuff in order trying to understand the environment in which we are because this will then be the foundation to engage in the search for new physics. And I think also the conclusion which are being built in this, uh, uh, well in that case now hypothetical uh, draft of an abstract of an application uh, are in general more or less the same and it is observed that all modes fail dramatically to describe the data. That is probably one of the things which we have to face and one of the difficulties we have to live with, we have to go out and measure and tune our Monte Carlos. The second phase, and this is now actually really a very interesting phase, and this is characterized now by uh, uh, event production rates at the level of 100 events per second. That's then the phase with as little, uh, uh, even at 2008, I have to say, a 10, uh, 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 a 10 TV, that's then the phase when we really go into a new energy territory. With as little as a couple of picobar being written on tape, we in principle now start to produce, for example, diechet events with kinematic energies, which go significantly beyond the reach of the Tevatron. So that's the phase essentially when we start to be, at least on paper, sensitive to the production of new physics processes. However, it's very early on in the games. 2008 is hopefully a couple of months from now. So that's very uh, unlikely that we will have understood the experiment to the level that we really can claim a discovery. But nevertheless, at least conceptually, we are already at this early stage in the complete new energy territory. And therefore, adiabatically, and then hopefully in the year 2009, we will be possible with as little, let's say, of one inverse Fentobahn be capable to uh, uh, tackle contact interaction scales, new physics scales at the level already of 5 to 10 TeV, and this then adiabatically will go at the level to 20 TeV with 30 and 40 inverse Fentobahn written on tape. But this obviously requires good and understood data. So that's the time really then in 2008 when we go into a new territory, and that will actually be a very exciting uh, time. The third phase, and so now we're talking about event production rates at the level of 10 to the minus 2 events <coughs> Per, per second at a startup luminosity of 10 to the 31. And you see here, we are now coming very close to the processes, the new physics processes we are being interested in. This is then the rediscovery of the high PT standard model processes. Uh, this is then when we will really have mass production of W sets and, t uh, and, and tops uh, at the LHC. And at this stage, really the LHC becomes then a real standard model factory. And the name of the game will be to measure these processes as accurate as possible, because they will be the foundation of our backgrounds for the new physics search. Clearly, we hope to go through these phases ideally already in the year 2008. So with 10 picobahn as being promised by, by, by Lynn uh, uh, in the year 2008, a 10 TV, we will have already a rather substantial data sample to our disposal, which will allow us to start engaging in the rediscovery of uh, uh, the standard model at 10 TV. And that essentially is one of a major uh, 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 program of work which we are currently trying to, to put in place. It's claiming back the standard model at 14 or 10 TV respectively, and as I said already, we hope that we be, will be capable of doing that in the year 2008 already, at least to a large extent. Now I can only give you a flavor of what kind of particle production we will look at, what kind of reconstruction we will carry out. We will first start with the, 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 the particles which we will produce at mass at the LHC, like JPSI to di, uh, dimuons, like Y to dimuons, and here we will be capable very fast, assuming that we have a reasonable tracking being put in place and a reasonable alignment to, to, to reconstruct these impressive mass peaks. Then we will migrate to uh, higher PT processes with uh, like the set to dimuons, which actually is a very clean process, and then also will start to 
rediscover the W, for example, W2 mu nu uh, in the final states. All these processes are not only important for the rediscover of the standard model and trying to understand how they are going to manifest itself in detail uh, at 14 or 10 TeV. These processes will also be utilized uh, uh, to the fullest in order to carry out the commissioning of our experiment, to use them, for example, to have a better understanding of the alignment, calibration, etc. So they're serving essentially two pers uh, uh, purpose. Now, to whether or not it we will be capable already in the year 2008 to rediscover the top, well, this is uh, definitely still something which is up in the air, but in principle, with as little as 10 picobarn at 14 TeV, i.e. 20 picobarn equivalent at 10 TeV, we should be capable to see a peak and therefore also have rediscovered the TT bar. But that may actually take a bit longer and we will have to see how far we can go. So now, in principle, if we have went through these three phases, we should be ready to engage into the search for new physics, and this is what it takes, actually, before you should start to engage in uh, the search for new physics. But before we come into detail what kind of physics we expect, I would like to take a step back and, and ask the question, what in general could be a potential timeline for discovery at the LHC? Now, since we're talking about discovery in new physics, to a certain extent, it's an ill-defined question because we really do not know how in detail new physics will manifest itself in our experiment, but I think we do have at least some historical data uh, from other machines to our uh, disposal which we can use in order to understand better how such a potential timeline might look like. And this is now coming to the title of the slide, good things come early and late usually in the, the lifetime of an Hartron Collider, and this can be proven actually with this plot which shows you the integrated luminosity as a function of years for two very prominent and very important Hartron Collider and particle physics history, the SPPS, for example, with UE1 and UE2, but also then the Tevatron. And what you see here is that the SPS, for example, had, once it was reaching a new energy domain, in principle, uh, immediately soon after the discovery of the W and Z boson. While it then took quite a while in this difficult LHC environment to carry out precision measurements, like, for example, precision measurements on the W and the Z boson mass. This is one of the properties. Very similar is also the, the, the behavior of the Tevatron. Now you would say, well, it took the Tevatron actually quite a while to establish the top bulk, and this is actually true. However, one has to appreciate that the Tevatron was starting at relatively low luminosities, and it had to match roughly the integrated luminosity of the SPS in order to really go into a new energy domain. And only then, when it went into the new energy domain, really then the, uh, uh, it was uh, possible to discover, uh, to see for the first time evidence for the top walk, and finally also then to discover the, the, to, the top. And again, another process which then explains to you why certain things do come late is the B sub S mixing, which simply a year ago essentially has been discovered. It's a very difficult process, even so it's being measured, uh, produced at mass at the, at, the, at the Parton Collider machine with two TeV. It's very difficult to establish it. It's very difficult to dig out these processes uh, out of their backgrounds and that's why one of the reasons why it took some time. Now, Im you can take this information to start coming up with at least a, a very preliminary and hypothetical timeline for the LHC. The year 2008, as I have already mentioned, will be the year, hopefully, where we will go into a new energy territory. However, we are very much aware of the fact that we will not, likely not, understand uh, this data uh, at day number one. Therefore, it will be more a year of uh, commissioning and uh, standard model rediscovery. While, however, I think the year 2009 could be really late if everything goes well as our first big year for potential discoveries. It will be the time where we hopefully at least have started to exploit the 2008 data to a certain level, have a reasonable understanding of our detector performance, have the machine under control, have at least a good feeling of how standard model will look like at 10 and 14 TeV, and then we will benefit immediately from the, vi from the high energy. So this could be actually the year of standard model plus X. And it's clear, another example of a timeline, that the Higgs boson discovery very likely will not come in 2009. Because in particular, if you focus at low Higgs boson masses around 115 and 120 GeV, and I will show you that later, it will take a substantial amount of luminosity and time because it's one of the extremely difficult measurements you can carry out, but we will definitely get an answer to that question and we'll come to that later. So this is one way of looking at the timeline. Another way of looking at the potential discovery timeline is 
essentially being uh, bet into, uh, embedded into a statement which comes now from Michael Peskin, which uh, 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 he made a couple of weeks ago on the conference. So many people now ask, will the LHC discover the Higgs boson? And his answer to that question is actually an interesting one, but I will come back to that later in my talk. By the time the LHC discovers the Higgs boson, that discovery will not longer be considered interesting. <laughs> now, to whether or not this is really true is one, is one argument, but built into this statement is obviously a very optimistic answer. It is the optimistic answer that we will have discovered something before we actually be sensitive to uh, uh, the Higgs boson. And that essentially is now asking the question, what could make Michael Pesking so optimistic that the Higgs discovery, quote unquote, will be uninteresting? Well, it is the standard model plus, plus X searches. There are many models out there, as a matter of fact, like contact interactions, excited quarks, low, super, low mass supersymmetry, gauge bosons, technicolor, extra dimension black holes, little Higgs, split Susie, uh, hidden valley models, etc., etc. All these models, in one way or another, do predict rather large production cross sections almost right from the beginning when we have reached the 14 TeV energy barrier at the effective uh, energy scale of 1 to 2 TeV. So this essentially is a, a very promising scenario. And in principle, we have studied with our Monte Carlos in great detail all these various different topologies and, uh, and models to understand how they are going to manifest itself in detail in our detectors to, to at least get a good feeling. And this is uh, incompletely su being summarized here in this list. So this is an early uh, discovery potential where I here have to insist that this, when we look at these very low numbers of integrated luminosities, which do correspond to luminosities which we easily should reach in the year 2009 in principle, this have to be understood data before we really can claim anything here. Now it is also clear, I think, that it makes, there's no point in really going in great detail through all of this individual uh, potential of models which we have studied, which both of the two experiments, big experiments, have studied. For that reason, I have decided to just pick two examples, which I think are representative examples, to explain to you a bit more in detail of what is the current planning and strategies which we are trying to put in place to eventually then really claim a discovery if nature then has chosen to pursue, for example, this or this path. And one is the set prime. It's an easy example in principle with the dial lepton resonances and the much more complicated one are the upper IT conserving SUSE searches, which in principle can also be considered, and I will show you that later, as to search uh, for dark matter candidates in our detectors. Both of them are very promising candidates for new physics models. Let's start with dial lepton resonances. And I've using, I'm using here the example of the primes, assuming that you know essentially that these dial lepton res resonances, which are an experimental signature, as a matter of fact, are realized in many different models, extra dimension models, frontal sunter models, etc., etc. So we simply use here now the set prime as an example to illustrate the reach. Now, if you go to masses of subtrine particles around 1, 1.5 TV for the different incarnations of these models, you will see that with as little as one femtobond, i.e. statistic which we hope to have available in the year 2009, we will produce 80 events, ballpark 80 to 90 events at this kind of mass, while the standard model background, which is mainly dominated by Charles Young, is essentially being negligible. So this is one of the rare scenarios where we do have at an Hadron Collider uh, uh, machine almost a background-free measurement. So we're only relying on the understanding of our detectors, and the detectors, as a matter of fact, have been built for dilepton, uh, to a certain extent, the dilepton resonances have been a design criteria for these experiments, going up to multi-TV uh, uh, muons, for example, or multi-TV electrons in the reconstruction, the same is true for photons. So with as little as 100 picobarn, this is being shown here in the set prime to die electron uh, uh, case from the Atlas collaboration, we are already capable of going up roughly to invariant masses for discovery of 1.5, and then if we go to one femtobarn, as you can see it here, just with this channel, already can go to invariant masses of 2.5 for these dilepton resonances, which then brings us almost a factor of three beyond the reach of the, where the Teverton is today, which also is something very, very interesting. So this was the easy case. A much more complicated case will be the generic SUSE searches at the LHC. Also, uh, uh, um, one has to say that in principle, for particle masses around 5, 600 uh, or 700 GeV, we have very large production cross sections being predicted. So at that time, essentially, with one femtobarn, the, the, the LHC will turn into a SUSE factory. We may see, quote unquote, these spectacular signatures of lots of missing energy, hard sheds, and many leptons in the final state. And clearly, both experiments have made a huge effort in order to understand what the potential SUSE 
discovery scenario and reach could be. And that is being summarized here in these two plots, where often the constrained MSSM, so it's a very constrained incarnation of a supersymmetric uh, uh, model, if it's been utilized in order to represent the reach, as you can see here in two very important parameters, M0, M1, half, and essentially ballpark, you could say that this is being relevant, one-to-one uh, 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 -one to, to the particle masses you can see and, the, and, the, uh, um, yeah, and, and how far you can reach. So there are many different searches which are different types of uh, multi-chat, multi-lepton and missing energy searches which have been studied and I think the important message you want to take out of these reach plots is that first, both experiments do have a significant reach to discover these already at the early days and second, that both experiments are very much comparable in their reach in general. Now, when we talk about uh, a SUSY search is what is it actually what we really mean with a SUSY search? I mean, I often get the criticism from the theory community that we experimentalists are tailoring our searches too much towards dedicated models, but we simply do not know actually what is out there, so we shouldn't do that. As a matter of fact, I think this is not completely true. We as experimentalists now setting up the searches are really focusing a lot on experimental signatures. And this, as a matter of fact, is how we are defining in both experiments a SUSY search. The definition is purely derived from the experiment experimental signatures. Therefore, a SUSY search signature is characterized by lots of missing energy, many jets, and possibly leptons in the final state. Clearly, in the picture of supersymmetry, it's easy to identify the sources for this kind of uh, uh, signature pattern, where in the missing energy, for example, will come from the LSP. So, our priority conserving SUSY is a very prominent and obviously a very, very well motivated model, which predicts uh, uh, this example of a signature, uh, of this famous signature and very powerful signature signature, but by no means I think it is the only new physics model for very good reason which predicts this experimental pattern. Many other new physics models uh, predict in this genuine signature and I just try to naively highlight this by replacing the new physics, uh, the, the supersymmetric particle with generic words of N1 to N6 and then N Wimp, which essentially you can take whatever model you like in order then to, to give these particles a name, but they should lead to the same signatures. And as a matter of fact, there are many models out there which do predict that this signature will happen. Extra dimension Little Higgs, Technicolor, all of them are essentially predicting very similar signatures. So if you like, you can come up with a naive, more generic definition for the signature. And this is what the SUSY search, quote unquote, actually I think is looking for. It looks for a pair produced new particle N with a color charge and the mass of order T V half, if you like, because it's the one T V scale which we will be sensitive uh, uh, first. Then N decays we are cascade into other new particles as well as standard model particles like boson, lepton, uh, and quarks. And that's another important important definition here now is at the end of the cascade there is a weakly interacting new particle to be assumed which often is being referred to as a dark matter candidate. So in other words, a SUSY search is a search for a weakly interacting stable particle that was produced in the cascade decay of a heavy new particle. And that's how we are trying to set up our searches by signatures, which are, I think, more generic than just going by model. For that reason, SUSY was a very convenient tool for us to dial with a well-understood environment the different uh, incarnations of these signatures, but we are very much aware of the fact that we have to be as generic as possible, in particular at the early days, and therefore try to not overtune our searches for a given model but rather go by signature. Now, let's spend a bit more time on this example of supersymmetry. I want to show you why it is actually so difficult to come up with a convincing discovery in this environment. Now, I have chosen the most sensitive individual channel you can look at uh, uh, for uh, multi-chat and missing energy, and that's the one where, uh, which is often referred to as the all hadronic search. So, there's no leptons in the final state. It has usually the highest branching fractions, and uh, it's the most sensitive one, at least on paper. However, it's also the most difficult one, because it requires that you understand an all hadronic environment on a proton-proton machine, which is definitely a challenge. In principle, it would be fully sufficient for this kind of event-type structures and with the relatively high production cross sections, which we are expecting for particles uh, around 500-600 GeV, to plot the missing ET distribution uh, in, in our experiment. And then we should be capable of making a convincing claim that we have seen a deviation from the standard model, even so that the standard model more or less has the same shape, and that also is something which is very difficult. However, 
However, this missing ET distribution is one of the most difficult distributions we have to understand uh, from the experimental or detector perspective because it's being polluted by many different aspects as you can see here in this plot from the DeZero collaboration. These are essentially now real data which they have taken at the Tevatron. So there's beam background which is being folded in. There are cosmic muons which contribute to that which obviously is unwanted. You have mismeasurements. You have additional noise in your colorimeter which you are not expecting. You have uh, uh, noisy channels in your colorimeter which you are not expecting. All these things need to be understood in detail and to be removed before you really come up with such a clean distribution. That's one thing. It's the experimental detector channels challenge. There's another one. We have to understand very well actually what the standard model background is at 14 TeV. With our cuts for this search, essentially we are pushing the standard model at 14 TeV, which we are anyhow not very well understanding at the, at the beginning, into a very specific phase space corner. And we have to really make sure that what we see here is not an access just uh, due to the fact that we have a misinterpretation of the standard model background, that, that it was really new particle physics production which has taken place here. For that reason, now for all of the searches, all of the important searches, now we are trying to be as little as possible dependent on our Monte Carlo and to measure directly the relevant background from the data. Now we have many different background sources, we have many different searches, so I cannot really show you in detail all of them. So I have picked one example to illustrate to you of what we are currently doing and what kind of strategies we are setting up. It's the data break, uh, driven background estimations for a very prominent background which is set to invisible plus jets. And you can easily see on this picture here that set to invisible because the two neutrinos we will not be detected by our detector and essentially ends up with a missing energy in multiple uh, uh, jet final state structure. So it looks exactly like the signal. It looks exactly like a dark mega signal, a dark uh, a meta candidate would manifest itself, for example, in our detector. So now we have to really understand this background very well, and the way how we are doing it is by establishing data-driven strategies. So we define control samples and try to understand the weakness and strengths of each of these individual control samples. An obvious control sample for such a background is essentially the set of dimuons. You have the muons, it's a very nice candle, we can reconstruct the muons very well. It has exactly the same kinematics than this process, but it has the big disadvantage that it is by simple electroweak arguments by a factor of six suppressed in the, in, in the, in the, in the production uh, uh, cross-section essentially, or in, in the branching fraction I should say. That means that in principle your control sample is hampered by the fact that it has less statistic than the, the, the one you actually want to measure. In in order to overcome this, at least as far as statistic is being concerned, you can replace now the set with a W and uh, gain therefore a factor of 10 in statistic. Again, simple electroweak argument why you have a factor of 10 uh, production more here. And the disadvantage is now here is that you only have one muon in the final state. So selecting these processes out of the bunch of your data is actually much more difficult and this process will therefore not be as clean. It may even have signal contamination which would not be nice as a matter of fact. For that reason we had to establish even the third uh, 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 control sample, which is now gamma plus jet. So we stack with the vector boson plus jet production, but now we replace the set with a, with a photon. And here now the new generation of particle physics experiments which we have uh, comes into play because for relatively high photon energies we can really select these data samples, gamma plus jets, rather cleanly. For that reason we have yet another control sample which we can use in order to uh, uh, really look into detail uh, uh, of how this process will manifest itself the mechanism measure it from the data. Now let's stay with the W and Z plus jets and to estimate Z to invisible. Also in this branch we are trying to pursue different techniques. One technique is a hybrid between a Monte Carlo tuning and a direct measurement from the data. So you try to measure generically the W and Z plus jet production as a function of the number of jets in the final state. So it will be suppressed by order alpha S if you go along with this axis. You try to measure it directly from the data. You also try to measure the ratio which is expected to be more stable as a function of the jets and you use these uh, uh, measurements as input to your Monte Carlo tuning and then utilize a, a, a tuned Monte Carlo to predict for example the set to invisible background for your dark matter searches. And now a direct way as is being for example pursued by the Atlas collaboration is to exactly carry out the same selection you want to do for your signal sample but in addition also require two muons and two electrons in the final state and with this one then you can also predict essentially the set to invisible component but as you can see it here it works really relatively well, but already here now the problem with the factor of six and the less statistic is coming in. And 
for that reason, we have now the other control sample being defined, which is gamma plus chats, which is yet another redundant way of looking into the system. And this is now being demonstrated here. As I said already, if you go high enough in the photon energy, in principle, the properties uh, of a set boson and a photon more or less become the same because then the set boson mass doesn't play a role anymore. And what you can see here is, at least in the Monte Carlo, that the, 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 the ratio between these two processes then becomes flat. We can select these processes very accurately, and if we go to photon energies above 200 GeV, and then simply remove the photon uh, from the event in an offline analysis, we will be able to essentially very nicely reproduce the set to invisible background as we measure it from the data. As a matter of fact, we cannot rely on one of the three. We really have to execute all three in order to be convinced that we have uh, a control over this background, because only then we really can claim a discovery uh, uh, outside of the standard model. And that is just giving you a bit of a flavor of what kind of work we have to put in place. That was one background for one particular search, and we carry out many, many searches with many, many different, different backgrounds. And we really try to, to pursue this path very, very uh, strictly, as a matter of fact. Now, still, we may see an excess in these exclusive, uh, inclusive uh, uh, dark matter searches or SUSE searches, if you like, but still, then it's difficult at the early days to convince yourself and maybe also the rest of the world that you really have seen in this difficult environment a deviation from the standard model. And here it would help that we may be a bit lucky to get this very nice and very clean, uh, uh, essentially, decay chance, which also may appear and are predicted in many different models together with the inclusive searches, which are jets missing energy and and same flavor opposite sign dileptons as they come out of this cascade. And they produce an extremely nice and clean signatures which we can measure very, very well. This kinematic edges, so to speak, at both experiments are very well equipped to see them. So if you see such an edge together with an axis in the inclusive searches, well then as actually you are having built up enough confidence, in my opinion, to really go out and tell the world, well, we have seen uh, 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 an axis and a deviation from the standard model in our generic multi-jet, multi-lepton and missing energy search. But otherwise, it may take actually a while to convince ourselves that we really have a significant deviation at hand. Now let's come to the standard model, Higgs boson. It is along the lines of good things come early and late or later at the LHC, and here is my personal opinion. Also, the Higgs may come late and therefore may, or I would say hopefully, will be not the first discovery at uh, the LHC. We still need to, f to go out and find it or exclude it, so there's really no reason to discount it, and it will be a major event for particle physics and for this laboratory and the LHC in general. There's no doubt about it. And in my opinion, it still is among the category of the most wanted dead and alive that or alive particles which we have and the reward I think is not appropriate with $5,000. It's probably more at the order of 10 billion currency units which is the price tag which we have essentially here on this machine because already this discovery alone or the answer to the question whether or not this particle will exist is in my opinion worthwhile the money which we, has inve we have invested in this machine. Now, we know today uh, that very likely the Higgs boson mass for many different arguments, and I don't want to go too much into detail, has to be below significantly 200 GeV. We know that this is the case for the standard model in order to be compatible with uh, the previous data which we have measured in particular at lab, but also at the Teverton. And we also know it for supersymmetric models, if you take, for example, the MSSM as an example, but just theoretical arguments that it has to be below significantly 200 uh, uh, GeV. For that reason, I want to focus now only on the processes which are sensitive below 200 GeV, but would like to point out that both experiments are being equipped to really cover all of the relevant mass parameter space going up to 1 TeV. Just for time reasons and for convenience, I motivate now the 200 GeV. So, the most important channel for low mass is definitely Higgs to gamma gamma. It has been, as you have heard in the previous talk, a design criteria for, uh, 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 for the experiment. It is an extremely difficult and challenging measurement because you have to really reconstruct a very small peak of, uh, on top of a huge background which is piling up, as you can see it here. And making really then convincingly this background subtraction to see this peak will take some time. It will take understanding and it requires excellent electricity electromagnetic colorimeter system being combined with high efficient and high performant vertexing systems. More easier is than the task for Higgs to WW uh, to, le to leptons in the final state. Unfortunately, this clean channel only 
covers a very narrow mass window around 150 to 180 GeV, but if the Higgs boson decides to sit in this mass window, we have already discovery potential with as little as one femtobar. The real golden channel, in my opinion, is Higgs to set, set star to four leptons in the final state. It is a channel which covers almost 80% of all the relevant uh, mass parameter space. Unfortunately, it's not capable to close the gap down to 150 GeV, simply because we will not have enough statistic, but it kicks in at 130 GeV, and it's one of the cleanest channels, actually, both experiment can measure the Higgs boson. Now, putting that all together, both experiments have made a huge effort of trying to understand what the reach uh, 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 and the discovery potential for the standard model Higgs boson will be. Both experiments are very much comparable in their, uh, in their potential, and this is now a recent result from the ATLAS collaboration, which shows you, as a function of the Higgs boson mass, the luminosity being required in order to make a five sigma discovery of the Higgs. It doesn't include all of the relevant channels, but also it, uh, but I have to say it includes most of them. What you can read out of this plot is in principle a statement I've made now several times in the course of my talk. Well, the most difficult part is the 115 to 120 uh, GeV region. It may take up to 10 inverse femtobarn and both experiment to combine before we will get a definite answer of a five sigma uh, uh, discovery. It will be much easier in the region around 140 to 180 due to the W, uh, w star to two lepton final state. And in general here then you see uh, uh, the other processes kicking in. Now also, uh, one thing is to look at the discoveries, another thing is to look at exclusion, because that will also be our job, and uh, this will actually be much closer to us than the discovery. So with one inverse femtobarn of understood data, we do have the potential, if we combine both experiments, to exclude a very large mass range, as you can see here with the ATLAS 95% confidence level exclusion plot, which is as a matter of fact here, but you always have to fold in that we have two experiments here. So we can almost go up to 130, 140 G of entire exclusion with one inverse femtobarn, only leaving then this very difficult mass parameter space open to us. We have discovery potential at 165 GV due to this channel, as I have shown you already. However, here I have to say that our competition on uh, the other side of the Atlantic, essentially, has already started to cover this region at 170 because it's also the region where they are most sensitive in. And uh, on the summer conferences, they have already excluded a very narrow strip of 170 GV. However, it is clear that they will continue to expand this strip, but it is extremely unlikely, in my opinion, almost impossible that the Tavertron will be capable of closing in significantly, for example, in this region here. This will be the task of the LHC, and the LHC will give us a definite answer. It may take 10, it may take 15 inverse femtobarn, but we will give a de get a definite answer to whether or not this particle exists. So that brings me then essentially to the summary. Um, in 2008, that will be the year of uh, machine detector physics analysis commissioning. It is a very intense preparation for physics uh, for the year 2009, and which I have tried to show you is very likely one of the big potential years for discovery of the LHC, if everything goes well as planned. The challenge is clearly the commissioning of machines detector of an enormous complexity, technology and performance, and also in parallel then to carry out uh, uh, the rediscovery of the standard model at 10 TV and understand the channel LHC environment so that we are really ready for the year 2009. The LHC will discover or exclude the Higgs by 2010-2011. Well, to be more accurate, we should express it in, in, uh, in statistics with 10 inverse femtobarn. We will get an answer to that question. I think this is almost clear. And the large phase space can already be excluded with one femtobarn in the year 2009. The LHC will discover low energy SUSY if it really exists. 2009 could become really the year of supersymmetry, the search for supersymmetry, or more generically, the search for a dark matter candidate. In particular, if this is then being accompanied with this very clean signatures of the edges, then I think we can easily and convincingly make a case for a discovery. But it may also take more time, depending on how nature is going to manifest itself. First thing signals might emerge already right from the beginning, and we may see it, but we may not be convinced that it is really a uh, deviation from the standard model. This will be one of the interesting discussions that we will have in the community to whether or not and at which stage we will really claim that we have seen a deviation from the standard model. The LHC will cover new physics scale uh, uh, of 1 to 3 TeV adiabatically, and therefore it will cover many, many very interesting models which do predict new physics signatures, direct new physics signatures uh, uh, at the LHC. So in other 
other words, the next years will be extremely exciting for, for particle physics, and I think we are all now very, very eager after so many years of, uh, of waiting and constructing the experiments and making essentially trial tests uh, for strategies that we now really have a chance to touch the real data. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any question? Nobody has a question, so. Yes, Fabio. Can you show your that prime discovery Say it again. Sorry. It must be in a smooth region, the mass of the Z prime for the different models, uh, coming from the absence of, of anomalous correlated interactions in that phenomenon. Where would that fall in your thoughts? And we're in the mass regime, essentially, here on, on, on this or on this uh, side, essentially, a, a Z prime production would be excluded by lab. That's, is that the question that you're asking? Lab to man, right? Hasn't found any signs of uh, anomalous correlation interactions. Right. That's the amount of the mass and the constant Well, it's certainly not in that regime of one to one point five TV, but uh, uh, but I cannot give you a detailed answer where it where it uh, uh, would be in that in that block. I don't think actually, as a matter of fact, that it will be in that block. But maybe I mean someone else, John, can you answer that? No, no, no. I cannot tell you that for hard work. My impression is that we should touch the region that, that you are describing in that picture. I don't think so, but okay, maybe. <laughs> Anything else? Well, can you really Luis? Luis? Yeah. So that they can be black holes? <laughs> <laughs> so the question is, is there anything, uh, any realistic chance to detect a black hole? Call it uh, a chance. I think, yeah, I mean, this has been studied in both experiments and uh, um, as a matter of fact, depending on the parameter space which you choose, uh, the production cross-section for mini black holes is comparable to the one for RPRT conserving SUSY. So it has a more or less the same event rate. So if this signature and this model is really realized in nat nature, it's also uh, uh, depending on the parameter, something which we could detect in the year 2009 already. And it will have spectacular signatures, which essentially then we will utilize the sphericity of these events in order to separate it from the background. That should be relatively straightforward, as a matter of fact. It will be more simple to establish such a signature than the RPRT conserving Susan, uh, signature. For yes, so yeah, we can. Um, if, if, as you say, something that could be supersymmetry is seen, mm -hmm. um, following what you said, what could be a, uh, a, a, a strong indication, a smoking gun, that it is in fact supersymmetry and not something else? Uh, this, this is a very good question. I mean, this is something which I, I think one has to start to appreciate. I mean, even. If we see access in these searches, for example, if we see that there is evidence for a deviation from the standard model, and if we combine it, for example, with this dilapto nature, so if we're in this very luxury position, even then, I think it's almost impossible to really make a statement that we have seen supersymmetry with respect to other models. I mean, we really would to measure in very great detail the properties of the particles which are being produced, and I think that the final, the, the, the final test you have to make is to make the spin relations of these particles. And that actually will take, if you take the LHC alone, a, a significant amount of time and luminosity, and for some of the parameter space, it will even be impossible to do it alone with the LHC. So, as, I mean, one thing is establishing a dis the significant deviation from the standard model in a certain signature. Another thing is to match this signature then to a true underlying physics model. That second part will take much, much more time. So we could still be for a while in a situation in which we don't know if supersymmetry is zero or not. Yes. Okay. We know that there will be a deviation from the standard model in the given signatures, but we definitely will not give you in the year 2009 the answer to whether or not it will be supersymmetry. 
you can probably build up an a case for evidence why it should be supersymmetry and nothing else, but I don't think directly from the experimental perspective you can tell. Okay, so I think let's thank the speaker again and all three speakers. So one more word from Nick Matthias. So you have to follow uh, here from the secondary we work uh, through the cafeteria and cross the small parking, cross the road and go to the big parking where the buses are to leave to the UN. And before that you can leave your staff uh, lock in the room uh, C.